Now, from what I understand, and my memory has let me down here, but the ruling by I have that problem. <laughs> uh, that that the creation science didn't fit the definition of science was very eloquently put. That it it failed on a number of key principles. Uh, it didn't embrace falsifiability. It was resistant to change over time. And perhaps you could just speak a little wow, bit about Wow, you know a whole lot about this. <laughs> fun to talk about somebody who actually knows this case. Well, I was hoping you could, yeah. you could take well, it from there. That's as much as, as far as I could go. No, that's great, though, John. That's wonderful. No, um, McLean was an interesting case because, of course, it did partially hinge on whether creation science is science. And the way the, the legal aspects of this kind of reasoning goes, the way the law works, I mean, I should back up first. It is not illegal to teach bad science in this country. Okay, you know, a school can teach that the earth is flat and the sun goes around it if it wants to. That's not unconstitutional. What is unconstitutional is to advocate religion in the public schools. The schools have to be religiously neutral. So... The argument that the defense, the creationist side, uh, had to make was that there was a legitimate secular reason for teaching uh, creation science. That, yeah, maybe there's some religious implications, but that's not so important. There's a good secular reason for teaching intelligent design. Excuse me, <laughs> that's later. <laughs> there's a real secular reason for teaching creation science, and that is because it's valid science, and the students would benefit from, from this instruction. So the plaintiffs, the anti-creationists, had to discuss what is science and why creation science didn't fit it. And that's how you started out this question. Um, you know, interestingly enough, since the early 1980s, the philosophers of science have paid, uh, have debated strongly what they call the demarcation problem, the demarcation, setting science as a way of knowing aside from other ways of knowing. And in philosophy of science, this isn't considered such a big deal anymore. Um, and part of this discussion was generated from the McLean versus Arkansas case, interestingly enough. But most of the ideas that you find in McLean are still considered valid by practicing scientists. That's kind of the way we do it. Now, even if philosophers of science may split hairs about um, about the uh, the validity of falsification, for example, as a as a criterion of demarcation, look, if you if there's not if there's no way to prove it wrong, most scientists would say, you know, if that's not really a scientific question. I can't test that statement, and that, of course, was one of the issues brought up in McLean, um, because creation science fundamentally and ultimately and at heart is a religious explanation. They're really saying, you know, <laughs> just like the uh, intelligent design people said later, the creation science people were really saying evolution can't do the job. Evolution can't explain this stuff, complexity or whatever, uh, the geological column, whatever. Evolution can't do the job, therefore um, God had to have done it. Therefore, God had to have specially created. Well, that's not an idea you can test scientifically. You know, God is omnipotent. God is therefore unconstrained. If you can't put God in a test tube, so to speak, if you can't hold constant some of God's actions in order to test whether something occurs in you know, the, your normal experimental kind of setup, then you're not really asking a question that can be, that can be dealt with through science. I mean, that, that's probably worth talking about a little bit, you know, because the nature of science is to test explanations of the natural world. And the way we test explanations about the natural world is we hold constant certain variables. So, you know, I've got these two plots of corn, and I want to know whether the fertilizer really does re reduce in a bigger uh, result in a bigger crop. Okay, so I, in order to convince you that that fertilizer really was responsible for growing more corn on this plot, I have to persuade you that I watered these two plots exactly the same. I gave them the same amount of sunlight. I cultivated both of them the same amount, kept the weeds out, kept the pests down and everything. And that the only difference between these two plots is that this one got fertilizer. Otherwise, you'd come back to me and you'd say, come on, Jamie. <laughs> you can't tell me that the fertili Scott fertilizer, I'm sure, I wish I had stock in the company. You can't tell me that this fertilizer is the reason for it. Because you didn't, you didn't water the, this other plot. You, know, you didn't control for water. You didn't hold constant the amount of water. That's what we mean by holding constant. And we all kind of know this. And you, you know, we, we, know we, we learned this in seventh grade about, about the experimental method. Well, 
put God into this equation. You know, God, don't make the you know don't make the corn grow greater if I fertilize it. How do you constrain God? How do you hold constant God's efforts? You can't. So science doesn't say there's no God. Science doesn't say God doesn't act. Science just says we can't test God, so we just leave him out. Uh, a good friend of mine, um, a philosopher of science, Rob Pennock, came up with a great phrase. He said, to say nothing of God is not to say that God is nothing. We just leave God out of scientific explanations. So getting back to good old uh, McLean versus Arkansas, um, when, when the definition of science was being debated, the, the notion of being able to bring God into a scientific explanation was something that the mainstream scientists strictly uh, refused to accept as part of the definition. They restricted scientific explanations to natural explanations only. And that is still the key element for how science is done, at least as recognized by practicing scientists. Okay, so I'm just going to follow up with one last question. Um, it's more of a philosophical question. And that, do you think that a belief in God and a affirmation of science are incompatible? Well, I don't have to address that as a philosophical question. I can address that as an empirical question. It's obvious that it is, because there are many people who are scientists who are also people of faith. There are many theologians uh, whose job it is, whose life it is to think about religious issues, who are enthusiastic uh, acceptors and supporters of science and who, who are, are excited by the things that scientists discover. So it's empirically obvious that, that there's no necessary conflict between science and religion. When a religion makes a fact claim, such as the creation science people will uh, talk about um, how Grand Canyon was laid down, for example. They believe that Grand Canyon was laid down by the waters from Noah's flood. That somehow you got 4,000 feet of layers of different kinds of rock all laid down in that approximately one year time that the water was covered with, that the earth was covered with water. Not bloody likely, but and they also claimed that uh, and, uh, Grand Canyon was cut catastrophically. A huge amount of water came sluicing through this um, 4,000 plus feet of uh, sediment and produced this big canyon in two weeks. Okay, that is a fact claim. Okay, you can examine that scientifically and we can look at the geological evidence of Grand Canyon and we can find lots and lots of evidence why that is simply incompatible with the idea, for example, that all those layers were laid down by water can't happen given what we know about modern geology. So we can reject that statement. Now, if a creation science person came back uh, and said, well, God did it that way, I believe God did it that way because I believe in the literal truth of the Bible and so that must be true. God did it that way but he just made it look like it was laid down by uh, other kinds of processes. Okay, now you've stepped outside of science. Science can't say that's wrong because science can't test statements having to do with God and the only the only statements we can test are those having to do with the natural world so if you step completely outside of that and bring God in as an explanator you know you've you're gone outside of science mm -hmm. so science can weigh and accept or reject fact claims made by science excuse me science can accept or reject fact claims made by religion but the basic idea that, there, that a supernatural exists, which is foundational to the religions we're familiar with, and I would argue as an anthropologist, foundation to the idea of religion inter, you know, across the planet, tribal religions as well. That basic idea of does a supernatural exist or not is not something science can measure. What I worry about is that the two may be somewhat incompatible in terms of where they start, though. For science, the ideal is that you start, start with a series of observations and you work your way th towards a theory. Mm -hmm. For religion, it seems to be the opposite. You begin with the theory and you work your way backwards. And that may inevitably result in you cherry picking the types of data that you choose to pay attention to. Um, do you have an opinion on that? Or